Hey friends, Todd here, doing a little prophetic pondering about the craziness of the days in which we live and the nearness of the return of Christ for the rapture of the church. And it's been um, a month or a little more since uh, we've been able to get together, so I'm just delighted to have this time to um, crack open the Bible and study with y'all and look at some things that... Um, it, as, as this seems to be typical for what we do here, uh, just kind of goes a little bit against the grain, I guess, of um, what you've maybe traditionally, historically been taught about the things we're going to talk about. So um, that's always fun, uh, at least for me, just to kind of um, dive in and just, you know, I, I think there's a couple of different ways to, to go about it, at least mentally, as I kind of prepare for some of this. Some of it is like, well, is um, does the scripture tell us something if we dig a little deeper, right? Does it tell us a little bit of a different story? Is there Are there alternative ways to understand this? Um, and would those ways have been a little bit more in line with how the original audience would have understand or would have understood these, uh, these particular verses or chapters? Another is um, just simply reading it without the filter of uh, without the lens, I guess is a better a better term of of just what we've always been historically taught. And asking myself, you know, if I were to read this again from scratch, is this without anything else having been taught to me about it? Is would I come to the same conclusions? And that's been an interesting way to approach um, scripture as well for me because I I grew up not only in church, but I grew up in a house where we, you know, prophecy was a, a regular thing. Uh, my mom, a uh, wonderful godly woman who uh, very much into prophecy uh, throughout my life. And so as I got older and kind of developed an interest in it myself, we've had great conversations. And, um, but there, there is a traditional way that a lot of these things have been understood. And and I'm not saying all of those are wrong, but I think um, because we have just been told over and over what a particular thing means, we need to kind of pull back sometimes and say, well, is is it really what it means? Is there maybe an alternate way to understand this? And it, could it be possible that maybe even there's more than one way, more than one right way to understand something? Um, we've talked about that before as we look at uh, the book of Revelation, that there are things that are clearly symbolic and there are things that I believe to be very clearly literal. And there are times, I think, when it's both. So um, anyway, that's, that's a long introduction. Basically, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here with y'all. And so I pray that you will grab a Bible, um, a pen to make some notes maybe even, and uh, that we can just sit down together and do some study. And, and I, think, um, I think you'll learn something uh, new because I know as, as I dug into this, I learned some things that I didn't know. And so I, my, my, my heart is always just to share that with you. But before we get started, my heart primarily in all of this effort is, is, is one of prayer that someone that doesn't know Jesus, that has never placed their faith in him, might stumble upon one of these videos. And I, I don't know how that would happen. Um, I just trust that you know, God is sovereign over this ministry effort and over anything that I do and certainly over the affairs of man. And if he wants someone here, he'll get them here. Um, but because that is a possibility and something that I actively pray for, I want to take a moment and um, address you, if that's you, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, if you've heard of him, kind of know about him, maybe heard kind of the kind of the tenets of, of what faith is, um, and you have maybe a, a, a little bit of an understanding, no matter what your situation is or background is, I, I, I want to speak to you and, and give you what is called the good news or the gospel. And that's really all gospel is, is just a word that means good news. It's kind of churchy sounding, but it's, um, don't be intimidated by it. It just means good news. Um, and, and good news is needed because our default setting as mankind is not one of particularly good news. Matter of fact, it's one of profoundly bad news. And, and no one really wants to talk about that or admit that. I've seen a lot of things going around in what little brief windows or glimpses into social media I do um, afford myself. I see a lot of people pushing the idea of a Jesus that is very, uh, sounds very good, 
uh, very warm and fuzzy, but also um, quite unbiblical in many respects. And much in the way that you cannot be described as, you know, if I was just giving a description of you, I couldn't just give a a one-word description and be an accurate picture of the complexity of who you are. Um, if I were to say, well, yeah, um, say your name's Mark, you know, well, Mark, Mark, he's a great husband. It's like, well, that's great, but there are, there even if Mark is a great husband, there's a whole lot more going on with Mark than just that aspect. And yet we tend to take that um, approach to Jesus. We tend to say, well, Jesus is, is loving and because he loves people, he wouldn't do this or he wouldn't think this or he wouldn't say this. And so as believers, as the church, we shouldn't take those, those approaches as well. And all of that is just highly, highly um, false. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an incomplete picture and an incomplete understanding of Jesus. But what does the Bible say about, about us and about our relationship with God? Um, one of the things I saw, I just talked about how, you know, we, we have this, you know, this great relationship with God already. Um, well, we, we don't. The Bible tells us that our, our default setting is one of being separated from God because of what the Bible calls sin. And so that's bad because sin carries with it a consequence. So we're going to look at all of those things. We're going to sum up the gospel for you and then just kind of give you some, some, uh, a little bit of unpacking of how you can understand the gospel, what it means, and then how to make the good news of it your own, and and the the the, the gift that is offered through the gospel, how to receive that. And so the gospel is summed up in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 2 through 4, which say this, this is the gospel, or the good news, by which you are saved, that Christ died for your sins according to scripture, and was buried and raised to life on the third day according to scripture. So we see a couple of things at work there. Number one, there is gospel. There is good news. Um, and it, it's the gospel by which you are saved, meaning there's not multiple gospels or pieces of good news that save you, but one. And it tells you that you need saving, that you and I both need saving. And so what is the gospel? It goes on to tell you that Christ died for your sins according to scripture and was buried and raised to life on the third day according to scripture. So we're coming up this week on, on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday where Christians recognize what Jesus did for them on the cross and then what, Je what Jesus accomplished in terms of triumphing over death, hell, judgment, the grave, all of it um, in resurrecting on the third day. So that is that is the essence of the gospel. Why do you need that? Well, let's look at this in terms of um, an ABC kind of format, just to help you remember it maybe and, and understand it. The A would be that you admit that you're a sinner. If you're familiar with any sort of 12-step program, the, the, the basic premise the, of, of, of point num of step number one would be that you admit that you have a problem. Um, right. If you if you you will never seek a solution to a problem that you don't acknowledge that you have. Um, all of us have a problem. The problem is is sin, and that's made very clear to us in uh, the book of Romans in chapter three, verse twenty three tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And talk about an unpopular message, probably as much then as it is now. Um, the, the people of Jesus' day thought themselves righteous and holy because of what they did and what they faithfully didn't do that they weren't supposed to do. It was all about their actions. And Jesus calls them to the carpet on that. You can't be good enough. All have sinned. All. It's a, um, sometimes we, we do a lot of, of Bible study and we look at a word to understand, you know, maybe a deeper meaning or a nuanced kind of meaning that we don't see in the English. Um, but it, it all means all. It's everybody. It's the best of us and the worst of us. All of us have sinned. Everyone from, you know, uh, the worst person you can think of, you know, say a terrorist, um, all the way down to like your pastor or your grandma. All of us are in the same boat and the boat has a hole in it and it's sinking. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's a bigger deal than it sounds like on the surface. 
um, because three chapters later in the book of Romans, in chapter 6, verse 23, it tells us, the wages of sin is death. So in 3.23, we're told that all of us have sinned. In 6.23, we're told that that sin has a wage. Now, you're familiar with a wage because of, of working, right? A, a wage is simply what you have coming to you because of what you've done. And so you have coming to you because you work, you have a wage, you have payment, and that payment is going to come um, because of what you've done. Sin is the same thing. There's a payment that's coming. It, it's a bill come and due, and it's because of what you've done. And that wage is in the form of death. Now, that death is not merely in the here and now, but it's an eternal one. And how do we know that's true? Well, that verse, uh, that's only uh, what I read and what, what I told you about Romans 6.23, that's only the first part of that. There's a second part of that. It begins by saying, the wages of sin is death, but it concludes by saying, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we see that it's all about Jesus, right? And we see that there is a gift that is being offered. And that gift, as opposed to a wage that you have coming to you because of what you've done, whether you like it or not, um, we see that there's a gift that's being offered. A gift doesn't have to be earned. It doesn't have to be worked for. You don't have to perform well to get a gift. Um, a gift is merely offered and received. And so, but the gift is eternal life, meaning that because the life that's offered as a gift is eternal, the death that comes as a wage because of sin is also eternal. So again, that puts us in a state of profoundly bad news. Uh, so what do we do about that? Well, as we looked at 1 Corinthians 15, that good news that saves us is Jesus' death on the cross and, and his resurrection from the dead. So uh, John, everyone knows John 3.16, probably if you've not been in a church in your entire life, right? It's probably the most famous verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So there's eternal life and death contrasted again with one another. And, and we see that, that that comes about through our belief in Jesus and what he did on the cross. And what he did on the cross, my friends, um, that we will commemorate this coming Friday is, is not just the execution of a good teacher that was misunderstood and that just irritated and angered the wrong people. It was, it was God and as I used to say in young life, it's God in a bod. It was God in human form, having lived the perfect life, paying that wage that you had coming to you. He took it upon himself. Sin and the death and separation from God that it brought, Jesus took upon himself. And he paid that price so that the gift of eternal life could be yours. And again, if you continue to read in John 3, you know, verse 16 is, is great. It's a warm and fuzzy, right? Everyone loves that. Oh, I, all I got to do is believe in Jesus. But if you read the next verse, you know, he, who's a, he who does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in God's one and only son. So um, it's, it's our default setting. It is, our default setting is one of brokenness, one of an incomplete broken relationship with God that we are powerless to fix ourselves. You can't be good enough. You can't pray enough. You can't give enough of your money away. You can't do enough good things to earn salvation. Salvation is always and only about what Jesus did on the cross. When he was on the cross, it was in your place and because of your sins and because of mine. And if you believe that, believing that is what saves you. If you believe that, then all that remains is to confess it. That's the C, the ABCs. Admit, believe, confess. Um, Romans 10, 9 through 10, says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So just like in 1 Corinthians 15, um, where we're told this, gospel, this is the gospel by which you're saved, that Christ died on the cross for your sins, rose on the third day. Here we see the same thing being, being told to us in Romans. 
Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. He is Lord because he conquered sin. He conquered death. Um, he paid the price that was demanded for the sin of mankind. So all that is left is to place your faith in him, to, to confess that out loud with your mouth, what you believe in your heart about him. If you believe it in your heart, it's just a matter of confessing it with your mouth. And if you don't believe it in your heart, then your confession means nothing. Don't bother confessing it because if you don't believe it, it, it accomplishes nothing for you, my friend. So, uh, but if you do believe it, all that is left is just to say so and, and receive the gift. And that can be as simple as something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner and I know that sin destroyed my relationship with you. It, it created a separation between you and I that can't be fixed on my end. You had to fix it. Um, it was too big to, for me to overcome. But thank you for sending Jesus to, to live the perfect life, to die on the cross in my place for my sins. I received that. And I received the gift of eternal life that you freely offer me by placing my faith and the finished work of Jesus on the cross for me. I believe you raised him from the dead, and I believe that he is my Lord. It, it, it's as simple as that. It doesn't have to be that those exact words. It can be, but it's just communicating with God out loud what you believe in your heart. Um, I would encourage you to do that today. That, that, that has been my plea um, in all of these videos, because at the end of the day, um, you don't know how much time we have left. Apart from anything to deal with prophecy, you don't know, you know, there are people that died today that did not think today was going to be their last day. Um, they had no clue. Um, many people, when they went to bed last night, they wouldn't wake up today. So you, because you don't know how much time you have left, your, your broken relationship with God has to be fixed in this life. It can't be fixed when this life is done. Um, it becomes fixed, all right? It becomes your fixed position. Your separation from God becomes your eternally fixed position with him. Only in this life can it be truly fixed. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So despite what popular culture would tell you, there are not many roads that lead to heaven, and Jesus is just one of them, or even the best one. He's the only one. He's the only way. It's, it's a very exclusive statement. And I get why it's not popular. But it's what Jesus said. So place your faith in him today. If you have any questions about that, please put it in the comments section. Um, I don't interact as much as I used to, but I do read all the comments. So, um, and thank you for those who put um, positive things in there. Um, and uh, that really has been a blessing to me, I, I will say. Um, there's a there's some regular folks that post encouragement, and, and that just means a lot to me. So I am very, very grateful for that. So let's dive in. Um, look, man, I do feel compelled to say, look, I'm coming off a very emotional week. Um, um, big, big highs and low, low lows. And um, at the end of the day, all good, but filled with challenge and filled with just um, raw um, rapid fire emotion. Uh, and I will say, um, praise God, we had uh, the high point of the week is my, my youngest daughter who um, was baptized when she was six years old, uh, went through uh, a rooted class. And I, I know a lot of churches around the country have rooted, so I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with it or not, but it's a 10-week kind of intensive small group. And um, and at the end of that, you know, she uh, wanted to kind of recommit through uh, being rebaptized. Um, uh, one of the bigger reasons is just um, as you know, nineteen years, nineteen and a half years old, she couldn't remember her six-year-old baptism and uh, just didn't have any memory of it. And she now, ha you know, sees the world through an adult lens and sees her faith very much through an adult lens and just wanted to make, uh, you know, a really adult decision. So um, that was just um, crazy joyful um, for her and for her family. 
And um, that was just um, highlight, highlight not only of the past week, but of, of my life. Uh, just really great. So proud of her. So um, look, I am, uh, so, so that was just one more thing that kind of, there, there seems to be things that, uh, the emotion of the past week, there's been things that are just part of life that you have to deal with and do. We've got challenges in, a fa in the family dealing with um, uh, just some health issues from ex an extended family. And we'll just kind of leave it at that without getting too deep in the weeds there. But um, it, it has kind of pushed back what I've wanted to do a video about for a while. And I knew it was kind of going to be a deep thing. So I knew it was going to require a lot of study. And so I've been studying um, quite a bit over the past month. And we're going to try to condense all that down and hit this, I guess, as quickly as we can. But um, what we're going to look at here is um, the prophecies in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, it might be helpful, um, and, and I know I'm I, I'm going to say this, but I'm going to also understand that um, probably most people won't do this. But um, in the Revelation 6 playlist, which, which pretty much... I drop a video, whenever I do a video, if, if it has any bearing on um, an alternative understanding of, and when I say alternative, I don't mean like crazy or wacky, but just non-traditional understanding of the timing of events in Revelation and specifically to Revelation 6, where I see the rapture of the church, um, but not where most people do. Uh, any Any video that has any kind of impact on that at all I, I drop it in that playlist. There's, I think, 46 videos in there now. But uh, there's a video I did called uh, Birthquake and Sense Around. Kind of a little play on words for movie people out there. Remember the, the sense around phenomena of the 70s. Um, but we, we cover some, uh, some Gog and Magog and Ezekiel 38, 39 stuff. And so I'm, I'm going to try to not get too deep in the weeds here because... Um, you can go back and look at that video. I'm not going to tell you to stop this one and go look at that one first because I don't, I don't think you need to do that. But I will invite you to go back and find that video and and review that because we'll cover some different ground, um, I would think, pretty pretty certainly. At least some stuff that we will probably touch on here, but um, dive deeper into there. So without further ado, and, and there's so many things I want to do. We're just going to start in Ezekiel 38 right now and... Uh, and just just read it, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about how this is traditionally understood, and and then um, where I think we can get a better understanding of this. So, oh man, I'm telling you, I said this before, but like I have not itched my nose all day. Uh, once I hit that record button, my nose just starts itching like crazy. So, uh, bear with me through those little uh, ticks and quirks, if you will. I'd appreciate it. Speaking of quirks. Grab you a drink, uh, drinking uh, Saturday's or Sunday's tea and Saturday's cup. So, uh, and let's just let's just dive in here. So, uh, Ezekiel thirty-eight and uh, starting in verse one, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say. So we're gonna stop there. So because. There are different translations, of course, and while I don't get into, um, I thought I had this pulled up, but I must have, um, I must have closed it. I, I, I don't do like the, the translation battles because I think it's it's just nonsense. Um, I believe God to be sovereign over His Word, and I understand how Bible translation is done, and the people that I, I see make the biggest deal over. Um, differences in the translations. Part of that is just a misunderstanding of how Bible Bible translation is done, and um, and how we've kind of come to those different translations. and And I think it's just good to look at different different ones. You know, um, I've, I've said before, I've got I've got a king my 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 go to my Bible that I study out of is an NIV study Bible. I've got um, a Ryrie study Bible, uh, which is an NASB. I've got a King James. I've got, I think the, one of the few things I don't have, I've, uh, I think I've got an even amplified somewhere. Um, one of the things that's really cool that I found is this, um, called the interpreter's Bible. Um, 
this is just Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. <laughs> it's a wealth of information. And within that, there's there are parallel translations, um, two, two of them, uh, a KGV on one side, I believe, and uh, it might even be the Revised Standard on the other. But um, anyway, it, it, it's got a parallel. So it, it's just interesting to look. So... Um, at, at how these things are different. So, for example, um, in the King James, uh, no, we'll even go the New King James. So, King James even says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, uh, or Magog, however you want to pronounce that, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Um, but the New King James reveals where we get some translation difficulty, which is going to be kind of the point of a lot of this. Uh, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So, uh, what I've grown up hearing is that uh, Gog is the uh, leader of Russia, and uh, Magog is the land of Russia because of this word Rosh that's here, that the, the New King James um, brings out. And the NASB uh, has the Prince of Rosh, um, but majority of these, at least in the, as I'm looking here on Bible Hub, uh, it does not have Rosh translated as, uh, the, the word translated as Rosh as a capital, uh, capital, as a proper noun, but rather as chief, so as in chief prince. So, that's probably where we're going to just kind of jump in because the idea of a chief prince is what flies over most people's heads. Um, because the Bible uses this term in, in, in a few different ways. So let's just jump in there. Um, I've got some notes. I've got Bibles open. I've got a book open. So we're going to be bouncing around a bit. So kind of bear with me and as we transition from thing to thing here. So, um, in the Old Testament, um, the term chief prince is used five times. Three of them are in Ezekiel, so we'll look at those. Ezekiel 38, 2, um, which says, uh, which we just read, um, Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So a chief prince over two, two regions. The other is in um, verse 3 which says this, and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Uh, and then in 39, verse 1, which um, is another prophecy, it says, son of God, or son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So there's three of the five uses of the, of the word, of the term, rather, chief prince. There are two other uses of this term. And here's where it gets a little interesting, I think. Um, one of them is, um, we'll, we'll just look at it. Second Chronicles 11.22. Let's just go here. Um, be easier just to go here. Second Chronicles um, 11.22. 11. Um, which the NIV translates actually a little differently, but it's the same term. Uh, Rehoboam appointed Abijah, son of Ma uh, Maaka, as the crown prince or chief prince among his brothers in order to make him king. So here we see this term, and it's applied um, to an earthly spiritual king, which tells you where we're going with our next one, because the other place this term is used is in Daniel chapter 10. So let's go to Daniel chapter 10 and, and verse 13, where it says this. Um, and, the, and, and we're going to unpack this in, in deeper detail because there's much more here than meets the eye. Um, but it says that Michael, uh, but the prince of the Persian kingdom, this is Gabriel who is coming to Daniel with an, with an answer to his prayer. And He's referring to that he, hey, you know, he, he started 
coming on his way with the answer, but he was resisted. And it says here, it says, the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. So there's an interesting thing that happens there. On the one hand, he's a king. On the other hand, he's or a prince. On the other hand, he's a king that he's wrestling with. Um, so so that's, we're not, we don't have time to go into all of that because um, that could be a deeper well. But um, let's look at, uh, let's just look at this. So uh, here, clearly, um, as we've talked about before, in a couple of different videos. So, so Michael is referred to as the only archangel that is named. So when you see um, later in the, in the New Testament that uh, Jesus comes with, uh, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, the archangel, um, the only archangel that is named in the New Testament is Michael. Now, some um, extra biblical books, uh, like the Book of Enoch, for example, does name other ones. But again, I, I think those books are important and good to know, but I don't count them as scripture. So you can do with what you want with that. But we do know that Michael is an archangel. Here he is, we're told that he's one of the chief princes, which tells you obviously that there's more than one of these things, right? So the question becomes, uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, it is we're, if we're as we're looking rather at Ezekiel 38:39 and Gog of the land of Magog. So um, and, and let's just look at that. I mean this is um, so the, um, the interpreter's Bible has has this that I thought was kind of an interesting thing to notice. Um, it says that the author knew clearly who Gog and Magog were is not certain. Erwin is right that he never intended Gog to be taken in its literal historical sense, whatever that was. So, like, we don't know. There's, it, it's very, they're very mysterious names that are used. Now, Magog does appear uh, in the Table of Nations. I think it's the son of Japheth, I think. Um, and but but Gog is used as the name of a Reubenite in like an obscure passage somewhere, but otherwise, is, there's nothing known about that as well. So what we have done is, and, and, it, and it says here, and this will be important later, but it also says here, um, the land of Magog is best taken as the territory belonging to Gog. So that's an important thing to kind of keep in your back pocket. So um, as we look at these these things and, and try to identify who Gog is um, and and what, what the land of Magog has to do with anything, um, there's a great deal of um, s scholarly attention that has been <laughs> been unpacked here. It's really interesting. Um, several things. Uh, it's like a lot of things that has to do with prophecy at all, whether you're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament. The scholars and the commentators are probably going to be a bit over the all over the road. Um, seeing some things that they agree upon um, and are in union uh, in unity over, but other things in which they are not. Um, I've got a note here that I think is relevant. Um, yeah, so again, the idea that um, that because of this word "rosh" that's in here, that that is Russia. Um, now, I, it's not that I'm not saying that Russia doesn't play an important role in the end times. Maybe, maybe it does. But does is that what we're talking about here? Or is there another way to understand this? Well, from Ellicott's commentary for English readers, he picks a thread that um, other commentators noted as well, and he pulls on it a little bit here. He says, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal said, rather the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Our version has followed St. Jerome in translating Rosh as chief, because formerly no people of that name was definitely known. The attempt to derive from them the name of Russia or Russian cannot be considered as sufficiently supported. So 
while it's easy to say it, that's what it is, um, because it's it, a couple of reasons. One, because in the passage of Ezekiel 38 and 39, it speaks of them as enemies from the north. And Russia is certainly north, um, but it also just kind of sounds like it. But again, Gog is called a chief prince. And we know that that's a term used in Second Chronicles to f refer to an earthly prince, but it is also used in the book of Daniel in chapter 10 to refer to uh, an archangel, Michael. So it, it has a supernatural or a physical uh, application. So which is it in, in, in Ezekiel 38? And because the, the, the predominant view, the, the historically traditional view has been that it's Russia, you can guess where I'm, I'm landing on this. And, and, and that it's it's not Russia. It's not a, 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 a it's not used in a spiritual manner in, in this particular um, section of scripture, but rather in a supernatural one. So there's evidence for that, and we're going to look at that and um, and unpack that in a couple of different ways. So first, let's just look at it in Daniel. Okay, so Daniel is really interesting because Daniel uses this term for prince. Uh, now, let's just take off. We're, we're going to look now not just at chief prince, but just at, as, at the word prince, okay? So, uh, uh, let's see. Grab my notes here. So, the chief prince is used of Michael in chapter 10, verse 13. The word for prince is applied in Daniel to a supernatural ruler in several places. Half of the 18 times this word is used in Daniel, it is used, it is clearly supernatural in nature. So, nine instances in, um, I think, seven or eight verses. So, let's look at these. Um, Daniel 8, verse 11. We're going to jump back here a couple of pages. Um, the context makes this clear um, that there is a starry host in heaven and that they have a prince that rules over them. So, let's look at this in Daniel 8, 11. So Daniel has this vision of a ram and a goat. And kind of in the middle of this kind of cryptic stuff, um, in verse 9 it says, uh, Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of heaven, uh, of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. So there's a starry host that are thrown down and trampled upon, and there is a prince that is over the host. So if you um, if you look at um, some of the parallels to these these verses in terms of thematically what's going on here, um, that th the stars are thrown to earth, we see that in Revelation. We see it in Revelation six at the opening of the sixth seal that the stars in the sky fall to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. That in itself um, points back to, uh, and I don't remember off the top of my head, so I'm just going to open up Revelation 6 real quick because um, I think I have it written in a margin or something. Um, um, yeah, Isaiah 34, 4. I think is where is where the other place where that is. Um, I, I never want to misrepresent the word of God. I pray about that all the time. And so I, I'm just going to make sure that I'm not saying that. And that's not referencing something else. <laughs> let's, let's just look at Isaiah 34, uh, verse 4. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. This is six seal stuff all over Isaiah 34. Now I remember where we're at. Um, yeah. Uh, first four, all the stars of the heavens will be dissolved and the sky rolled up like a scroll and all the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. So clear parallels there and clearly um, the, the starry host. And, and we did a, uh, I think I did a video, I think it was called The Mystery of the Starry Host. Uh, definitely angels. These are definitely supernatural beings that are being talked about here. So, um, so in Daniel 8, 11, we've got this, this picture of a prince or, or the starry host and then a prince that is over them. That same thought, though, continues. If you look at um, 
Daniel 8.25. So uh, we, we get this word again, but uh, I, I, I need to unpack this a tiny bit first because this is the interpretation of the prior vision. So the vision that Daniel receives uh, goes up through verse 14, I think it is. Yeah, verse 14. And then from 15 on, we have the interpretation of the vision. And uh, Daniel makes clear that this is a vision relative to the end. Um, the end of the age, the end of time, uh, day of the Lord, actually, because it talks about the day of wrath. Uh, verse 17, the second half of verse 17 says, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end, which in itself echoes um, Habakkuk 2.3, which is uh, the vision awaits an appointed time. Uh, and we, which is language we see carried up again in verse 19 of chapter 8 in Daniel. I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. So, so much just in that, that there's, there is an appointed time. There is uh, a time that God has set the end from the beginning. This is all not a mystery to God, and he is not up in heaven, pacing around, rubbing his hands together, sweating it out, wondering, man, when can we get this show on the road? He is chill. He is, his, I don't know if it was James McDonald, somebody said, you know, God rules the universe with his feet up. Um, he is not stressing about this. Now, it doesn't mean that God is disconnected or dispassionate. He certainly is in pursuit of hearts, but um, there's a, an appointed time that all this wraps up. And, be, and we don't know when that is. So in verse 25, so again, the, the angel's telling him, all of these things that you're, that, that you, you just had this vision, this is all about the time of the end. This is a far future fulfillment. So, uh, so in verse 25, it says this, uh, he, speaking of this ruler that's going to come, he will cause deceit to prosper, uh, which has... Lots of connections you can make with Second Thessalonians 2 about um, the Antichrist coming with uh, signs and lying wonders, and then also that God giving mankind that's still here at that time um, a strong and powerful delusion that they would so that they would believe the lie. So the lie that the, 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 the man of lawlessness comes with, it prospers because it bears fruit and it, it is believed. So that's just kind of an aside here. So he will cause deceit to prosper and will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. So that's you know, Revelation 19, 19. Um, and I think, let me just look at that real quick because I don't know if that's, if I'm just referencing the theme here or an actual verse. So... Part of this is, I've got notes everywhere in my Bible, and sometimes I just have to review, like, okay, well, what am I talking about? Um, 1919, right? Is that what I said? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's not the specific word, but but the theme, that um, that's what that's talking about, that he's destroyed, but not by human power. So, um, but so you have princes, and then you have a prince over the princes. Um, clearly supernatural that we're talking here. Um, these are not earthly princes and then princes over them. These are supernatural beings that have a prince over them, and we know that that's Jesus. And again, we're told here again, um, uh, in verse 26, uh, it concerns the distant future. So so Daniel, uh, uh, so there's three of your, of your instances of this uh, use of the word prince. But then there's some other as we get... Into, into chapter 10, <clears throat> that it's not just in verse 13 where Michael is called the chief prince, but the, the, the idea of princes as being supernatural entities is all through this chapter. And so again, just to be, um, uh, to be clear, let's see. Okay, so this is, uh, again, this is the angel that comes to him. And what's, what's interesting here, and we've, we've unpacked this in a video as well, um, that this, this revelation is given to Daniel, and it concerns a great war. 
And so when I started doing um, the kind of series of videos about the war in heaven, that is what I think we're talking about here. And there's so many parallels to that. Um, I, I think if you can understand that and get your head around that, I think it will just really help understand not only Daniel, but a lot of what we see in terms of a coming um, cosmological con uh, conflict. And um, so, uh, yeah, let's just pick this up. Uh, we'll, we'll look at back again. Let's just go um, start in verse 12. So uh, then he, being Gabriel, uh, this, this angel that appears to Daniel, then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. So there's a prince that's over a, an earthly kingdom. Um, clearly, since Gabriel is a supernatural uh, um, being, an angelic being, that the, this prince that resists him is not an earthly one. Um, because we know Michael comes to help. So we have the prince of the Persian kingdom. He resisted me for 21 days, um, which is interesting in itself, but I, I have time to go into that. We've covered that before. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vis vision concerns a time yet to come. So there we've got uh, the prince of Persia uh, mentioned, and we've got Michael mentioned as a prince. And then we skip down to verse 20. He said, uh, so he said, do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. So he's going to go back. He's going to have to have it out with him again. And look at what it says here. Uh, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Okay, so um, we don't have time to get into that, but it's clearly a, a another spiritual ruler over a territory. These are territorial, supernatural um, rulers is what we're pointing at. Um, and then it's because look what it says. Um, but first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. And then it, parenthetically, this angel says, no one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. So now we see that Michael is his prince, the, uh, Daniel's prince. The, and, and we see that Michael is the prince for Israel. So he is the chief prince in charge of the nation of Israel. And again, no one supports Gabriel against the prince of Persia and, a, and the prince of Greece except Michael. Clearly, so much going on here supernaturally. Let's just pick it up, the last one in Daniel. In, um, uh, ten, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, at that time, the great prince who protects your people will arrive. At that, I'm sorry, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. So that's, you know, Matthew 24, 21. It's Revelation 12. It's it's all of this. <clears throat> so, but here, Michael is referenced specifically as the prince who protects Daniel's people. So, and we see that the war in heaven, when that begins, that it is Michael that takes his stand against the dragon, which we're told is Satan or the devil. And it's Michael that stands up in Revelation 12 and takes his stand against him at, during the war in heaven. And, um, oh man, I had another thought there. Uh, hang on, let me say it. <laughs> Let's see if I can snag it back before it gets too far down the road. Um, Oh, yeah. Um, just, just really kind of an aside, but, you know, when we hear that at, at the rapture, uh, that Jesus comes back with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, well, that means the archangel is there. And so if we see, so Michael is present at the rapture. Why would he be present? Because I believe the war in heaven happens as a result of it. And we see that story play out in Revelation 12. If you look at Revelation 12, the dragon is standing before the woman to devour the child the moment it's born. The child is caught up, harpazo, rapture, um, 
to God and to his throne. And then, like the next event that we're told about, um, aside from kind of like this, the woman fleeing into the desert piece, but like the next thing that the dragon does is goes to war. And so this war in heaven happens very, very closely subsequent to the rapture. And so um, just really, really interesting. So Revelation 12 is very clearly pointing a finger at, at that, Revelation 12, 7. So, uh, so that's, that's just in Daniel. So all of, all of those, those things, the, these, the term prince. Now, there are other places, I believe, in the Old Testament that I've come across where prince very well could be um, a reference to something supernatural. We're not told. But if you look at context, for one, uh, they're talking about, there's, uh, I think it's Isaiah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 30, I want to say. Let me see if I can just see it real quick. I think it's, Ezekiel, or maybe it's 29. No, it's 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just look at the context. So it, it doesn't say one way or the other, and it could go either way, but it says, uh, Isaiah 30, 13, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I will destroy the idols and put an end to the images in Memphis. No longer will there be a prince in Egypt. And I will spread fear throughout the land. So prince here, it's like, is it an earthly prince? Maybe, but the context is with images and idols. And just so you know, the overall context of this uh, is the day of the Lord, which is when the, the princes get dealt with. It's when the nations are reclaimed for God that God assigned to these other. Yeah, we could get into all of that another time. Again, uh, we're going to look at a little bit from this, but this book, The Unseen Realm uh, by Michael Heiser, I just can't recommend it enough. Uh, it, it will really open your eyes to uh, some of the weird, <laughs> weird stuff in scripture, but it will help you understand the story that's being told. But if you look at Ezekiel uh, 30, Word Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Wail and say, alas for that day, for the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. A day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. For the sword will come against Egypt and anguish will come against Cush. And it goes on and on. And, and this is in this chapter we covered before, this, this, this section where there's these laments for Egypt and, uh, and prophecies of, um, against Pharaoh. And where there's this language, yeah, well, well, we'll, we'll get that here in a minute. We'll, we'll get there. But, um, so let's look at this, this whole idea though, that, that there are, that this terminology that's used here for earthly rulers is also applied to supernatural ones. And we're going to look in the New Testament for that. There's, there's spiritual applications of the word prince in the New Testament it's in the Old Testament, it's um, Tsar, which is where you get the Russian word Tsar from, actually, which is kind of interesting in itself. But it's uh, Strong's Hebrew 8269. But in, um, let's see, let me go here. Hang on just a second. I want to go. Um, go here and open this. Go to the interlinear just to get a, just for the sake of um, a comprehensive approach here. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, it's of course it's not there. I can't find it. Oh well. And now I'm now I've got to be a little uh, persistent. We'll just go to Daniel and go to Daniel ten. <laughs> 13. So, um, yeah, 8269. Uh, and it can, it, it's translated in a lot of different ways, but a chieftain, chief, ruler, official, captain, or prince. Uh, in the, uh, in the Greek, however, it is Strong's number 758. And that word, whoops, hold on. Greek, there we go, is archon, uh, or archon, rather, um, which is a ruler, governor, leader, leading men with the Jews, an official mem uh, member or a member of the executive 
uh, of the assembly of the elders. So here's here's where this is um, going to come into play. I think properly, a preeminent ruler or chief, a commander with authority or influence over people in a particular jurisdiction. So, do you see how this idea, as uh, as a as a, as this word that's translated as prince or ruler, um, commander, governor, um, how this can, can be applicable to a spiritual entity that is over a people in a particular jurisdiction. And that's where we're going we're gonna to get back to Ezekiel, uh, we are. But um, in order to kind of answer the question, is this chief prince, is this an earthly one or a supernatural one? We have to unpack this this word a little bit further to see how it's also been used elsewhere. So we're just going to look at some instances of this. So uh, in Matthew 9.34, Mark 3.22, and Luke 11.15, these are all uh, parallels that the Pharisees recognize a prince demon that is over lesser demons. So let's just pick one of these. Let's just go to Mark 9.34. And we're going to look at, um, come on, computer, work with me here, baby, uh, 934. So um, this is where Jesus heal, heals um, uh, the blind and the mute. So uh, so while they were doing this, a man who was, de well, um, say, so Jesus um, touches their eyes and their sight's restored, um, tells them, don't go tell anybody about this. They went out and spread the news about him anyway. <laughs> So, um, which like, yeah, how can you blame them, right? So while, while they, they were going out, a man who was demon possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said nothing, nothing, uh, well, I'm sorry, and said nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So the Pharisees are recognizing that there are demons, and that they have authorities and rulers. There's a hierarchy that exists. And we see that in the angelic realm, and we see that in the demonic realm as well. When you look at Ephesians 6, um, where, where Paul is talking about, you know, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but you know, rulers, principalities, authorities, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. This is, this is indicating hierarchy. So let's look at John 13, 20, or 12, 31. It says, now the, this is Jesus talking. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Okay, and so Satan is, is referred to as the prince of this world. Not named um, as flat out here, but um, clearly that's who Jesus is talking about. And if you look at 1 John five nineteen, 19, uh, we, we, we've talked about this a lot. And, and we see this, uh, the reality of this verse playing out all over the, all over the world that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Satan is in control of this world, my friends. Um, as complete aside, uh, one of the things that the Spirit has just impressed upon me uh, in, in the last month is that this world is filled with darkness that wants to swallow you up. Uh, it wants to swallow everyone up. Uh, because the world, the whole world, is under the control of the evil one. 1 John 5, 19. Uh, and that's what Jesus is saying here. The prince of this world will be driven out. Now, this is this is prophecy. This is Jesus speaking about what's going to happen. Um, he he picks, this, picks this theme up again in John 14 and verse 30. He says, For the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold in he has no hold on me. Um Again, this is applied to Satan as the prince over the whole world. Um, uh, my notes here, it says, see also Luke 4, 5 through 7. Uh, oh, yeah, well, let's look at that. Yeah, that's kind of interesting now that I think about it. Um, now that I remember what that is. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Did I say 4, 57? No, 4, 5 through 7. So Luke 4. It says, um, this is where Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness. Uh, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor 
it has been given to me and I can give it to whoever, to anyone I want to. If you will worship me, it will all be yours. <laughs> Notice what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus didn't counter his point with, no, Satan, you do not have authority over all of the kingdoms of the world. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus refutes him on the, on the point of worshiping, but he does not call him out that he's, that he's lying to him about whether or not he has authority. There seems to be agreement that what Satan is offering is legitimately his to offer. That's just kind of an interesting thing. Um, so John 16, 11, uh, for the prince of this world now stands condemned. So for the third time, John applies this term to Satan as the prince of the whole world. So this term prince has much, much more um, than a, a, an earthly, human, uh, physical application. So this one I find, I, I've always found this passage really interesting. Um, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 8. So, um, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, <clears throat> uh, which is verse 6. Verse 8 says, none of the rulers of this age understood it, God's secret hidden wisdom. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This whole, whole idea of rulers of this age, that's the same word that we're looking at here. That is translated other times as prince. Here it's translated as rulers of this age. Most, but not all commentators, see earthly rulers. Um, however, understanding them as spiritual makes more sense in context and supports Paul's view of supernatural powers and authority uh, against and at war with mankind in Ephesians 6. So, um, you know, the whole idea that, um, to me, it just makes much more sense that these are spiritual. They thought they were gaining a victory that the forces of darkness when Jesus was crucified. And the idea that if they would have understood what they were doing, they would never have, they would never have done it. They would never have motivated the people to, to crucify Jesus Christ um, because it was their undoing. It paid the sin of mankind, as we talked about in the opening. So uh, the whole idea here is um, Jesus and God manipulated the powers of darkness into doing what they wanted them to do. And, and we're going to circle back around to that theme again in Ezekiel because that's what God does and what, what we see at play in Ezekiel 38. So um, Ephesians 2, verse 2. Uh, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. Paul clearly applies the prince designation to Satan. This passage also tells us that Satan is no earthbound enemy after the death of Jesus. Here's why that's important. Because there are people, people that I love and respect and as teachers and authors and people that have helped me in my walk that see Revelation 12 as something that happened in the past. And while you can make application to to uh, Jesus' life and the death of Jesus um, being referred to there, there's so many reasons why it's not just that. I'm not saying it's not also that, but it has um, future implications. And, and that's that's a whole other video for another day. But in, in Revel those who see Revelation 12 is all about the death of Jesus and the events told there, therefore, all past tense, are not aligning that interpretation with this verse because this, this verse is after the death of Jesus, right? So what the people that hold that interpretation of Revelation 12 would say is that um, Satan was cast down and the war in heaven happened after Jesus' death and ascension to heaven. The caught up, um, harpazo, um, refers to Jesus ascending to heaven, which is not really how Jesus ascended to heaven, not like snatched away violently by as an open show of force, which is what the, the word harpazo means. Um, but so if they say that, 
if that's if that's what they what they're interpreting this as, then Satan can't be the prince of the power of the air because he's confined to earth in Revelation 12, right? Um, we're told, woe to the earth and to the sea because the devil has been count, has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that he has a short time. Now, there's some interesting parallels in Revelation 12, just as a, another aside, about how um, Satan goes off to make war against uh, the woman's, uh, uh, the, the, um, the offspring, which would be Christians. And we know that that's what Satan does. He makes war against believers. But Again, Revelation 12 is, is primarily, I believe, a future tense event. And so we know that the war in heaven, therefore, is also future tense. And Paul refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. He is not earthbound at this point. Um, and then lastly, Revelation 1.5, um, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The word ruler is the same word. Uh, it's the word Tsar. It's uh, uh, Greek, Strong's Greek, 758. Um, so all of these are pointing to um, uh, the, the idea that this word for ruler, be it in Hebrew or be it in Greek, is also applicable to a spiritual ruler. So if, as we look back then at Ezekiel 38... Oh man, I have a bookmark got taken out, and I don't remember where that initially that went in Daniel. Um, sorry, talking to myself. Um, so you not only get conversation with me, you get conversation with me uh, where I'm talking to myself, and also you. So it's three-way conversation. So the, the next thing I want to pull out here is I think really important in determining whether or not... Um, Gog is the chief prince over two different um, earthly regions or whether he is a spiritual prince over territory, over regions. Um, because look at what happens here in verse 4. Referred to twice in, in verse 2 and in verse 3, twice as chief prince. Look what it says. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. So where I want to where I want to focus on here is this idea of putting hooks in their jaws. Um, this is this is Leviathan imagery. Uh, we we have talked about that uh, in the Leviathan videos that we did together. Um, but, but let's just look at that. We're going to look at two different places where this whole idea of, being, of having hooks in the jaws um, are pointing to. I think I can take my... Actually, I'm going to put this back here and take that pen out now. Um, let's go to Job 41. Almost. Oh, <laughs> wrong way, Todd. This way. Job 41, and this is uh, this, this lengthy description in God's discourse and kind of dressing down of Job, uh, and he talks about behemoth in uh, chapter 40, which again is behemoth and Leviathan are two different chaos monsters. Uh, that's an important thing to understand if you're going to understand kind of um, the supernatural worldview and end times kind of prophetic worldview. Of, uh, of, of of the original audience of the Old Testament. But look at in verse 41, it says, can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? And so we know that Leviathan is a dragon, number one, because we, we go back here into verse 15, his back has rows of shields tightly sealed together, each so close to the next that no air can pass between, this being Leviathan. Um, they are joined so fast to one another, they cling together and cannot be parted. His snorting throws out flashes of light. His eyes are like the rays of dawn. Firebrands stream from his mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from his nostrils, as from a boiling pot over a fire of reeds. His breath sets coals ablaze, and flames dart from his mouth. This is a dragon, 100%, right? 
but we're also told at the end of the of, of chapter 41 he is king over all that is proud so um, this is we you know in those Leviathan videos we clearly pointed out that this is Satan and when we, we see the dragon in Revelation 12 make make his appearance that's there's language that ties back to this whole idea of that's who Leviathan is so that's where this whole idea of hooks in the mouth or hooks in the jaw. And we're going to also look at Ezekiel um, earlier in chapter 29. Much like we looked at it in chapter 30, this is where we've got um, these, these oracles and prophecies about Egypt and about Pharaoh. And I believe they are they're kind of used symbolically uh, because there's things that are pulled out, but then there's application that's made in a much, much broader sense. And we, we, we covered that in that video, but um, where, I, where I talked about this. But look at what it says here in uh, chapter 29, verse 3. Speak to him, speak to, um, to Pharaoh, and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, you great monster lying among the streams. Uh, uh, yeah, m among the streams. And that's the Hebrew word. The, the word monster is the Hebrew word tanin, and it's a serpent or a dragon. It says, you say, the Nile is mine, I made it for myself, but I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your stream uh, of your streams stick to your scales. I will pull you out from among the streams with all the fish sticking to your scales. Or we may circle back around to this or not, but there's, I, I'll, I'll just say this here. I will leave you in the desert, you and all the fish of your streams. You will fall on the open field and not be gathered or picked up. I will give you as food to the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air. That is um, uh, 30, uh, Ezekiel 39. We've looked at 38, but that's Ezekiel 39, verse 4 through 7. So um, so here we've got this same, same kind of thing. We've got this dragon imagery and God putting hooks in the jaws to, to, to drag them along. Well, that, all of that points to exactly what we're looking at here in uh, verse four, in verse four of Ezekiel thirty-eight, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army. Um, the interpreter Bible I thought was really had a, a good little insight here. It says this: um, because of the cosmological nature of the conflict. So, the interpreter Bible is seeing this as cosmological um, in, in in nature, in terms of its conflict, supernatural, if you will, rather than earthly. So, look at that again. Because of the cosmological nature of the conflict, the imagery, the imagery of the capture of the dragon may be used here deliberately. And it points back to uh, 29 verse 4 that we just looked at. So there's this whole idea that, um, that God is, in, in one of the commentaries I read, um, it did have an interesting thing. It said that, it, that the, uh, matter of fact, I'm, did I leave that open? I don't think I did. No, I'm not going to go chasing it now. Um, but it, it kind of, it was the idea that um, God is causing this chief prince to do something he's not going to do on his own. It's not going to be something he's ordinarily going to think about doing. Because it's God who puts the hooks in the jaw. It's God who turns him around and draws him out. So, so anyway, so... Um, again, I'm not doing a, um, just a, a lengthy exposition here, but just to get our, our head around, um, is Gog a chief prince in terms of Second Chronicles 11.22, like an earthly prince, uh, which is how it's typically traditionally understood, or is it is Gog a prince in the way that Michael is a prince in Daniel 10, or that... Um, the prince of Persia is a supernatural prince, or that the prince of Greece is a supernatural prince, or that Satan is referred to multiple time, multiple times as a prince, um, as Jesus himself is referred to as the prince of peace, right? We, we, that's, that's one of the ways that we refer to Jesus. He is the prince of peace. So I, I'm clearly, you know, tipped my hand here how, how I'm coming down on this and I think it changes like what we look for, what are you looking for um I you know I think even in that 
earthquake video. I had not gone this deep into the Chief Prince aspect um, to where I kind of was solidly in it. I might have mentioned it, maybe, that there's a different way to understand it. But um, I, I think it's really, really clear. And, and I think... So, um, let me say a couple of things. So, um, first, if... I believe there's two conflicts at play. We're just going to, like, touch on this because I, I unpack this much, much more in that birthquake video. That there's there's a um, Ezekiel 38 and an Ezekiel 39. And... I think these are two different instances. And the reason being is that the, the way they're, and, and commentators are, you know, all over the road on this one as well. Um, scholars don't agree on this. But the way that they're dealt with and the way that these things kind of unfold, um, they're dealt with, it's seemingly in ways that point to two different places in Revelation. In Ezekiel 39, I just, I, I, I showed you that, how um, in Ezekiel 29, you know, we're told that Satan is, um, I'll leave you in the desert, and you and all the fish of your streams, you will fall in the open field and not be gathered or picked up. I will give you as food for the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air. Well, that, if we look at Ezekiel 39, um, and, and if... If say that's conflict B, I guess, or the second, um, it says this. Look at uh, verse 17. Son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Call to every kind of bird and all the wild animals. Assemble and come together from all around to the sacrifice I am preparing for you. The great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel. There you will eat flesh and drink blood. You'll eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of princes of the earth. That's interesting. Uh, it does say princes of the earth, but um, wow, that's a place we're not going to go. But um, that's going to be some, uh, I'm making some mental notes to dig into that a little bit more. That's I didn't see that one coming. Uh, goats, uh, let's see, here we go. Princes of the earth, as if, as if they were rams and lambs, goats and bulls, all of them fattened animals from Bashan. Okay, that's important to keep that in mind because Bashan is very important. We're gonna when we look at this um, this place in Ezekiel or in Unseen Realm where this gets unpacked a little bit more, we're going to uh, Bashan is going to be important um, thematically. At the sacrifice I am preparing for you, you will eat until you are glutted and drink blood until you are drunk. At my table, you will eat your fill of horses and riders, mighty men and soldiers of every kind. Declares the Sovereign Lord. But there's a feast being prepared and the animals and the birds of the air and all of that business, you know, right? What's it say? Um, I will leave you in the desert, you and all the fish of your streams, and you will fall in the open field and not be gathered or picked up. I will give you as food to the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air. So that's, again, where in 29, it's speaking of this symbolic Pharaoh and, and, um, and uh, Egypt, here we're talking about Gog and Magog, but I think we're starting to get some overlap. And if you look at Revelation, at the end of Revelation, I think it's 19. Um, I did not have this marked. Do I have it here? <laughs> Hold on. Hang on. I'm pretty sure it's 19. Maybe it's 20. Nope. Oh, yeah, it is 19. Uh, yeah, look at look at Revelation 19. So this is toward the end, right? This is the end of the story. This is when Jesus is, has come back on his white horse. And in 17, it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Tell me that don't sound exactly like Ezekiel 39 and the outcome of that. So you may be saying, well, Todd, you said that these are two different conflicts. What's the what's the other one? Well, the other one, I think, we can see where how that one ends up. 
And there's, you know, we, we get day of the Lord language in 38 uh, and 39, but um, we, day of the Lord is kind of uh, not just a day, obviously. Um, but, you know, we, we get, you know, 14 is what the sovereign Lord says in that day when my people of Israel are living in safety and um, verse 10 on that day. So we're getting this build up. Uh, verse 18, this, this is what will happen in that day. So day of the Lord. Um, that, that's, those are signal words. Uh, when Gog attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I declare that at that time, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment upon him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on him and all his troops and all the many nations with him. This is Revelation 6 and Revelation 8, like all over it. So Revelation 6, bear in mind what you just read, but that's, that's six seal language. That there is a, um, um, there's a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth, the moon uh, uh, made of goat hair, the whole moon turned blood red. Stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Global earthquake felt all over the world exactly as we see described in Ezekiel 38. And then, you know, we have this recognition here in, Ezekiel, in, in Revelation 6 that the day of the Lord has come. We get a pause, the pause button is hit, and we get a ceiling of the 144,000. We get um, the great multitude that appears in heaven. And then when things get, get back on track, in Revelation 8, the seventh seal is opened. And again, I believe very strongly that this is the war in heaven at this point. And we see conflict going on in the heavenlies and things being cast down to earth from the heavens. But, you know, look what it says here in, in Ezekiel 38 again. I will execute judgment upon him with plague and bloodshed, pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, burning sulfur. Um, and uh, I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains. That's, um, we've looked at that, that the, the, the mountains dripping with blood, um, melting with blood, rather. Um, we did a video on that. But, you know, another angel had a golden censer, came stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with all the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. We're in Revelation 8, um, looking now at verse 4. Smoke of the incense to get, okay, let's just skip around. Um, uh, verse 5. Then he, the angel, took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. So there you've got um, uh, the fire cast down to the earth. The first angel sounded his trumpet in verse 7. And there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the uh, trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So, uh, parallels in language here. So, I, I think Ezekiel 38 is speaking of the, um, the initial conflict. So, I believe it may be even the catalyst for the rapture. And then you've got this uh, Ezekiel 39 conflict that seems to point to the final one at the end. So let's look at just a couple more things here. And then we're going to, there's another place where, um, where I think this has very helpful application. So first off, <clears throat> we're I'm really going to try to wrap this up, but <clears throat> I told you we'd be reading something out of the unseen realm. Ezekiel 38, 39 is addressed and it's in, it's toward the end of the book. And there's a supernatural conflict that's um, pointed out here as well. And I'm going to read some stuff to you here. Let me, I don't want to set anything on top of my Bible. So we're going to move that over here and I'll set this here. So um, again, understanding this is in, in um, chapter 40 of the book and <clears throat> it's part eight 
and it's talking about the sinister supernatural north. So I'm going to read some of this, um, but I'm going to, let's see, where's, where's my notes? Ah, oh, here we go. There's that. Okay. So I'm going to read some of this is set up. Um, and then I'm going to go, because our idea, our study here of this, this Prince terminology um, is going to come to, uh, come to bear. But then there's some other stuff that's in a very long footnote. And um, you may read and not like footnotes. And I typically um, would put myself probably in that category. But in things like this, there are times where like his footnotes, like, <laughs> like this is the content of the page and this is the footnote associated with that page. And the footnote is where some of the gold is. So um, we're going to dig into that just a bit. Again, I'm going to go um, quick. So the word north in Hebrew is zaphon. It's uh, T-S-A-P-H-O-N or Z-A-P-H-O-N in some transliterations. It refers to one of the common directional points. But because of what Israelites believed lurked in the north, the word came to signify something otherworldly. The most obvious example is Bashan. We've devoted a good deal of attention to the connection of that place with the realm of the dead and with the giant clan populations like the Rephaim, whose ancestry was considered to derive from enemy divine beings. Bashan was also associated with Mount Hermon, the place where in Jewish theology, the rebellious sons of God of Genesis 6 infamy descended to commit their act of treason. But there was something beyond Bashan, farther north, that every Israelite associated with other gods hostile to Yahweh. Places like Sidon, Tyre, and Ugarit lay beyond Israel's northern border. The worship of Baal was central in these places. <clears throat> these cities of Phoenicia and Syria were Baal's home turf. The fact that the center of Baal worship was just across the border was a contributing factor in the apostasy of the northern kingdom of Israel. Specifically, Baal's home was a mountain known as Jerob al Akra, situated to the north of Ugarit. <clears throat> in ancient times, it was simply known as Saphan, um, which again, the Hebrew word for north. In it was a divine mountain, the place where Baal held council as he ruled the gods of the Canaanite pantheon. Baal's palace was thought to be on the heights of Zafunu Zafan. Baal was outranked only by El, or by El in the Canaanite religion. However, Baal ran all of El's, of, I won't say El, El's affairs which explains why Baal was called king of the gods and most high at Ugarit and other places, <clears throat> which in itself gives you some sense of why Yahweh is called most high in our Bible. And Ugaritic, not because he's Baal, but because a lot of what we have in our Bible is addressing specific beliefs of surrounding religions. And it's like, no, Baal is not the most high. Yahweh is most high. Baal was also said to ride on the clouds. So we see lots of places, specifically in the Old Testament, where Yahweh rides on the clouds. <clears throat> it was the, the author's way of saying something true about, uh, about Yahweh, but in a way that was sticking a finger in the eye of those who worship false gods. It's, it's a polemic. So we've talked about that before. So let me pick this back up. Um, another, uh, okay, in Ugaritic texts, Baal is Lord of Saphan, or Lord of the North. He is also called a prince. Uh, another of Baal's titles is Prince, Lord of the Underworld. So the idea of a prince being a supernatural being is not something we're only pulling here out of the scripture, but also out of Ugaritic texts and what the people in the far north thought of the deity, the deity that they worshipped. They considered him a prince as well. This connection to the realm of the dead, of course, dovetails with our discussion of the themes associated with the serpent figure from Genesis 3. It is no surprise that Zebul Baal becomes Baal Zebul or Beelzebul. And 
Beelzebub, titles associated with Satan in later Jewish literature and in the New Testament. In short, when an Israelite thought of the north in theological terms, he or she thought of Bashan, Mount Hermon, and Baal, or Baal. Later Jews would have made connections to the great adversary of Genesis 3. So, about Gog, Magog, and Bashan, uh, Heiser says this, The prophetic description of Ezekiel in Ezekiel 38-39 of the invasion of Gog at the land of Magog is well known and the subject of much interpretive, uh, interpretive dispute, both scholarly and fanciful. One of the secure points is that Gog will come from the heights of the north. Uh, 3815 and 392. While many scholars have focused on the literal geographic aspects of this phrasing, few have given serious thought to its mythological associations in Ugaritic Canaanite religion with Baal, Lord of the Dead. An ancient reader would have looked for an invasion from the north, but would have cast that invasion in a supernatural context. In other words, the language of Ezekiel is not simply about a human invader or human armies. Um, an ancient reader would have also noticed that this invasion would come at a time when the tribes had been united and dwelt in peace and safety within the promised land. So um, we'll go on. The Gog invasion would be the response of supernatural evil against the Messiah and his kingdom. Uh, this is, in fact, precisely how it's portrayed in Revelation 20. And we're going to get to that. That's where we're going to go last year. Um, uh, Gog would have been perceived as either a figure uh, empowered by supernatural evil or an evil quasi-divine figure from the supernatural world bent on the destruction of God's people. For this reason, Gog is regarded by many biblical scholars as a template for the New Testament Antichrist. While Magog and the Heights of the North aren't precisely defined in the Gog prophecy, the point is not about literal geography per se, which that's how we've always interpreted this, right? That's how I've always heard. This is all literal geography, and that's all it is. And it's it's about, it, it, I, I believe there's some of that in here, but I believe it's much, much more. Rather, it is the supernatural backdrop to the whole Northern foe idea that makes any such geographical reference important. For, for sure, ancient Jews would expect that the reconstituted kingdom of Yahweh would be shattered by an enemy from the north as it had before. But ancient Jews would have also thought in supernatural terms. A supernatural enemy in the end times would be expected to come from the seat of Baal's authority, the supernatural underworld world realm of the dead, located in the heights of the north. Gog is explicitly described in such terms, but there is another similar trajectory in ancient Judaism and the early church that has been noted by scholars. The Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan, located in Bashan. And I've talked about this a couple of different times, but he, he unpacks this a little bit. It will just give you some helpful kind of brief context. The heart of the idea emerges, emerges from Genesis 49, part of the Messianic Mosaic. The right to rule Israel is linked to the tribe of Judah, and the one who holds its scepter is a lion. Genesis 49, 9 through 10. In contrast, Genesis 49, 17, Dan is referred to as a serpent, fitting imagery for Bashan, who judges his own people. Deuteronomy 33.22 picks up the theme. Uh, the theme, Dan is a cub of a lion. He leaps from Bashan. Dan is an upstart inferior who will attack from Bashan. Dan is thus an internal outsider, an enemy of Yahweh's people. Those who interpreted these references this way were also quick to point out that Dan is omitted from the list of tribes that yield 144,000 believers in Revelation 7. And that's the thing that we've talked about, that aspect of, of Dan and, and prophecy that they believe points to the Antichrist coming from that tribe. My point is not to argue for, for, for a specific view of the Antichrist. All eschatological systems are speculative in many respects. So true. That's why I welcome everybody here. If you agree with my interpre interpretation of things or not, because 
they're at the end of the day they're my interpretation i believe you know i try really hard to um, interpret through the lens of scripture and what scripture says rather than the traditional ways that we've just been taught and leave it at that but at the end of the day it's an interpretation so uh, the point is that the supernatural worldview of ancient israel and judaism must inform our own thinking the cosmic enemy from the supernatural north where the council of evil plotted against Yahweh's council was a fixed part of the worldview of the biblical writers. So, we're going to cover just a couple more things. I want to hit these, um, these, uh, this footnote. And I'm not reading this entire footnote, just the highlighted section here. Because he goes on to unpack all of um, different things, uh, different have some different threads and different notes here. It says, the name Gog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 may reflect a personification of spiritual darkness if it derives from the Sumerian word Gug, a G-U-G -G with like a, uh, uh, a foreign pronunciation mark. I don't remember what it's called off the top of my head. I should because I've designed fonts at one point. Um, but I don't, uh, though this is uncertain. So again, it may reflect a uh, personification of spiritual darkness. Okay. Um, then it says, uh, the Septuagint text of Amos 7, 1, again, the Septuagint is the, uh, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, of Amos 7, 1 mentions Gog as the king of the locust invasion described in that chapter. Locust imagery for invading armies is familiar in the Old Testament, but Revelation 9 connects that language with demonic entities from the abyss. So interesting that in Amos 7.1, Gog is the ruler over the locusts. And in Revelation 9, it's locusts that come up out of the abyss, and they have over them a king as well. So um, it says... Uh, this is significant, not only since the abyss, a, uh, a Greek term, uh, abyssos, is connected to the underworld or Sheol, but also because the original offending sons of God in Genesis 6, according to 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 6, 1, or Jude, Jude 6, and uh, 1 Enoch 6 through 11, were imprisoned in such a place. Revelation 9 may therefore describe their release at the end of days to participate in in a climactic confrontation with God and Jesus. So Gog may be like a, it's almost like a, a more generic name, like a job description, rather than a specific name. And we'll, we'll, because of the, for one, because of this, because um, Gog is mentioned as the, as the king of the locusts in, in the Septuagint in Amos 7, but there's a different, king over them in um, in Revelation 9. So it says this, uh, in, in wrapping this footnote up, this matrix of ideas may be designed to tell us that the Gog invasion does not describe an earthly enemy, but a supernatural demonic enemy. Boom. And that's his mic drop. Um, that's exactly where I'm landing in interpreting Ezekiel 38 and 39. Does that mean we should not pay attention to Russia and what they're doing? No. But I think the the nations that we see as um, going to come against Israel uh, are supernatural in nature um, that are exerting influence over real people and territories. So um, so I just want to hit two things and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Um, I just found this interesting. Uh, looking up the name, my, my wife um, just um, love her so much and the spiritual insight that sometimes she throws at me that I was like, why didn't I think of that? She's like, well, what does the name Gog even mean? It's like, look it up. Like, what's the names have meanings? I was like, yeah, okay. Well, what does it mean? Well, um, uh, found this website, uh, Abarim Publications, and it's <clears throat> where I've looked up a lot of different names in the past and um, they have some really great information. They say this about the etymology of the name. Where the name Gog comes from is not clear. BDB Theological Dictionary resolutely declares its root unknown. Uh, Jones's Dictionary of Old Testament Proper Names, on the other hand, points towards the Hebrew word gag, 
um, and I can't read the Hebrew letters, but it's, it's, it's geg, usually meaning roof. Now, this is an excerpt from a, uh, a, uh, Ibrahim Publications Biblical Dictionary. It's so their own biblical dictionary. The noun gag means rooftop, but since society was a house, its rooftop referred to that society's governing council. Very interesting because that just dovetails so perfectly with all of this, all of these ideas that we're seeing unfold here about Gog being a supernatural entity that is exerting influence over regions of the earth. So here's the way that I kind of, um, where I landed with this that helps me understand it, I think. And, and we're going to look at Revelation 20. Uh, so given all of, all of this, all that we've talked about tonight, as well as the insight from the unseen realm, um, a simple understanding of Gog and Magog could look like this. Gog equals chief prince. Chief prince equals a spiritual ruler over a specific territory or territories. That comports with, um, with what Paul, how he describes this hierarchy of um, spiritual enemies that we have. Magog, then, would be the lands and people under the control or influence or authority of, the spirit, of their spiritual ruler, prince, or commander. So you've got, um, you've got it meaning, essentially, a chief prince, a spiritual ruler over a territory, and the land and people under their authority. That helps us, I think, tremendously when we look at Revelation 20, because in Revelation 20... It is Satan that is calling forth Gog. But, and it's not just from the north now, it's from all over. Let's look at Revelation 20, verse 7. This is after the thousand-year reign of Christ. Satan is released from his prison. It says, um, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. So, that means that here in Revelation 20, verse 8, that Gog and Magog does not have to be restricted to, A, a small handful of nations to the north, because they're not. It's, it's like from the four corners of the earth is where we're told they come from. Nor does it have to be restricted to earthly um, rulers, Gog and Magog. So, that said, um, a more clear understanding of what's being said here might sound something like this. And I'm not trying to give a new interpretation of the Bible. I'm just trying to plug in what Gog and Magog means into this passage that we've probably a lot of people have read and went, Gog and Magog, wait a minute, that's Ezekiel 38, 39, so maybe they're making connections. This is when 38 or 39 happens, but um, but we, we don't see the things descript, described there um, afterwards as, um, as happening because here fire comes down from heaven and devours them, So like, but none of the other stuff that's mentioned. So here's, here's a way to understand that. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his present prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Their spiritual chief princes and, the, and rulers and all the lands and people under their influence and control and gather them together for battle. That, I think, is very helpful, at least to me, to understand that and um, harmonize it with what we see in Ezekiel 38, 39. As I've said before, my, my grid here is LSH. Um, it's, is this t interpretation logical? Does it make logical sense? Is it scriptural? Uh, does it have scriptural support? And does it harmonize? Does it take other passages where we're talking about similar or the same things, and does it make them harmonize, or are there conflicts? So that's where, we end. That's where we're ending today. That uh, is a lot. That is the proverbial sip of water, a sip of water from a fire hose. And um, I appreciate, uh, I'm just thankful to God we be able to get all this out. This has been on my heart to do this for a long time. So I'm really grateful to be able to get this study out there. Um, 
uh, mindful that we're running long, but it's just a lot of ground, obviously, to cover. So again, I'm not saying we should ignore that Russia may play a part in the end times movement of things, but that what we're looking at in Ezekiel 39, number one, it may be tied specifically as uh, to the rapture as its catalyst because of what we see in Revelation 12. Uh, but two, that um, Satan may be, with, with our interpretation of this being only earthly and only geographical, Satan may be doing a little bit of, you know, sleight of hand, where God is all looking over here for something physical, when the real thing that we need to be paying attention to is what is going on spiritually. Where Israel's concerned, um, and this prophecy is about that, because that's what um, these enemies are drawn out to do, is to go against Israel. Um, where that is concerned, I think, um, man, what days we live in, right? Where October 7th happens, and now October 7th has become like September 11th. And it's a day that you can know what happened just by saying the day. Um, and this, as, we, as I've said before, I, I think the events of October 7th, you need to really put on a critical and biblical thinking cap and see this as a physical representation of a spiritual reality. It is nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And that kingdom against kingdom we've talked about many times. That is spiritual kingdom against spiritual kingdom. So it's nation against nation. Yes, it's earthly. It, it's also kingdom against kingdom, spiritual. And those two things are, are spoken of by Jesus together because they are both in operation here. They, they work together. The kingdoms of the, the, the nations of the earth have over them rulers, dominions, authorities. So what we see on October 7th, what we saw there was the spiritual reality played out physically. So that tells me that we are that much closer because these things are going to continue to ramp up, I believe. And I, I think we're just that much closer to God pulling the trigger on the day of the Lord getting us out of here and um, bringing what is going to be a uh, wrath of untold fierceness and horror that you do not want to be here for. So as, as we said at the beginning, place your faith in Jesus now. While there is time, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Um, confess your faith in him today and receive the gift of eternal life. I love you guys. Um, appreciate you. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.